about uh, my work and what I did for the United Nations system. Um, I most recently completed a tour of, we call it the United Nations Dingo Tour, of, uh, as, as a vice rector of the United Nations University Institute, uh, University, as well as a director of the United Nations University Institute of Advanced Studies. The, the United Nations University was set up in the mid-1970s as an institution to provide advice, studies, research for the United Nations system. We are part of the UN Secretariat's division for conducting studies. Our headquarters is located in Tokyo, Japan, and we have uh, institutes on various subjects located in various parts of the world. The institute that I headed is located, well, it was located, uh, the reason is that it recently moved to Tokyo. It was called Institute of Advanced Studies. Now we added a term called sustainability. So it is now called United Nations University Institute for the Advanced Study of Sustainability. Now, I don't want to make it to be a very boring university type lecture, but I want to make it more interactive. I will, of course, give some content for my talk. Now, sustainability is a term, it become almost like a buzzword. You will hear it on the media, companies talking about sustainability, and NGOs, and governments, and of course, the United Nations talks about sustainability. Now, I would like to get a feedback from you. What do you think sustainability means? Some um, volunteers? Yeah. Yes, please, John. It means living within, within our means as a person, as a culture, and as a species. Indeed, yes. <laughs> it, it, it means that to sustain something, to sustain a way of life, sustain a way of culture, so that, that's what basically means, that it is sustained to, for, for our own lifetime, for the lifetime of our children, and our children's children like that, for posterity. Now, these are some of the key concepts that I will be using here. Sustainable development, and the concept of development itself, sustainability science, and peace and sustainability. Now, Sustainable development has become a very important concept for the past 30 or 40 years. Because there is something wrong with the development. That the way that we are going about living on this planet, so there, there is something that is uh, not right. We have various problems, environmental problems, extreme poverty, we have climate change, biodiversity, loss of biodiversity loss. We have, we have loss of various cultural forms that are disappearing from this planet for various reasons. So that's why we developed this concept of sustainable development, development that could be made sustainable. Now what is development? What is development? Any volunteers? Development? Those who have studied biology or science would have understood the term development? It's progressing. Pro progressing, yes. It progress. Is, <laughs> it's, it's, it's evolution, it is progress, it is change. Change, yeah. yes. So, what we're talking about development here is human induced change in the environment, in society. And, and with the help of technology, knowledge, and various other, other kinds of things. So I, I would give you a, a very sh brief history of uh, humanity since our last ice age. We said the post policy period, the last ice age, happened about 12 to 18,000 years ago. So it was a large shift of human living conditions from being bands, small group of people, to tribes, to settled communities, to nations and empires. This is just a, a, a sweeping 
way of looking at the way that human beings have evolved. Since we feel that the human species evolved and left North Africa, in the Rift Valley, to various parts of the world, and then we evolved from there into different groups as a, as a result of our adaptation to different climates, different environmental conditions. So we developed different skin colors and different, you know, so we look slightly different, but ultimately we are all part of the same family. And we develop in different cultures, we can become nationalities and so on and so forth. That is the reason why we have different conflicts at the moment, because we forget that the commonality that we have as humans, as one. We develop different religions, different cultures, different languages, of course. And, and, and that is great. The diversity of human cultures, human humanities, it's a wonderful thing. But that once that becomes so exclusive that we are the only ones, that we have the right, that, you know, we, then that creates misunderstanding, the fear of the other. That, that, that is some part of the problem that we're facing today. And how we can coexist with all the great diversity that we have. The different nation states, different religions, what some people believe, or some people don't believe. But we need to coexist on this planet. But on, on the way, we have made tremendous progress in terms of our living conditions of, since the satellite the culture. So we developed various civilizations, various communities, and we learned the stories about those things. Now, one thing that changed dramatically the way we developed was since the Industrial Revolution, which happened about two to three hundred years ago. The Industrial Revolution, many of you might have heard about the Industrial Revolution. One of the hallmarks of the Industrial Revolution is the way we did work. We, 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 we as human beings, evolves all kinds of tools, all kinds of techniques, so improving our agriculture, improving our canal systems, water preservation, and, and so on and so forth. But, and that created its own civilizations and its own way of living. But we made a dramatic shift from that with the use of modern science and technology about 200, 300 years ago. We say that it, the modern industrial revolution started somewhere in England with the use of steam power, that drove machines much faster, we were able to produce things much faster, and we just moved production from households in the small communities, the factories. Well, I can go on and explain this story for a long time because I used to teach courses in the history of technology and the industrial revolution many, many years ago. One of the things that we found very useful was the use of fuel, energy. The way we started using energy. We found coal, we found gas, we found petroleum, then later on we found nuclear power, and we know we are living with the consequences of that. But all these things started with the, the great intention of improving our quality of life. But later on, what we found out was that all good things have something bad about it, some negative consequences of that. So how to create the right balance of understanding the problems of our progress and addressing that. So we are not very good at it. You know, we make tremendous leaps in our technological knowledge, scientific knowledge, but we are lagging behind in terms of understanding the consequences of that. Had we had that wisdom, that foresight, the foresight about what might be some of the problems, then we would be using some of the things that we have, or we would adapt that into a, a better design or better product. But we don't have that. You know, now we are developing some of those techniques, but still we are far behind in terms of understanding the consequences of our actions. So scientists are now saying that the human, the, the evolution, the history of, the, of our planet was shaped by various events, like earthquakes and uh, like the asteroids striking our Earth. And that, that sort of change happened over billions of years ago. But most recently, human beings are creating a new condition that as a result of the way we live, which some scientists call the Anthropocene. That means that, that we, anthros, humans, are creating a, a new 
epoch, new, new way of the way the earth evolves, develops. A, fa a famous scientist, uh, Paul Crutzen, who won a Nobel Prize in chemistry, is one of the foremost thinkers of this field called the Anthropocene. That human-induced change is now shaping the world, shaping the planet, from the way that great natural forces change the world, but now human beings are creating the, uh, uh, shaping the earth in a different manner, which we call the Anthropocene. So the Anthropocene studies are, like for example, the way we burn fossil fuels, that create carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, and various other pollutants, and that is now adding more carbon dioxide in the water, for example. The oceans are becoming more acidified, and that is creating a chain of events within our planet. So you, you, you can hear about all these things when you talk, when we read about climate change and so on and so forth. So this is what development has taken us to now, that we have created our own epoch, our own era of human-induced change. And how we can manage this <coughs> to live on this planet is going to be the key question of development. That is what sustainable development has to do with. I'll come back to the other aspect, aspect of sustainable development in a moment. Now, I started with my lecture about sustainability, right? It's about uh, maintaining something. It came from the Latin word, sustainer, means to hold, to hold up something, to maintain, to endure, to support. So how biological systems, like for example, ecology endure, remain resilient, protective, and become diverse. That's what's wonderful that we live with the uh, well, we have this great biological diversity that we have now, but we are losing that. A large part of it naturally, but a predominant part of it is caused by us, our activities, industrial activities, clearing of land, and all so on and so forth. So we have a major problem related to loss of biological diversity. So the key question for us is how to sustain development that is environmentally, socially, and economically viable. That is the idea of sustainable development. It, it, it can't be just one aspect alone, just economic sustainability. It, it has to be all these three. And also maintaining our cultural viability also, sustaining that. I will come back to that in a moment. So the, the term sustainable development gained currency in the 1970s when we, with Rachel Carson, for example, an American biologist, <clears throat> writing in the 1960s, talked about the dangers of chemical pollutants that we put in the atmosphere. And she wrote a book called The Silent Spring. This was a remarkable development in making us aware of the consequences of industrialization, the way that we are shaping this world. We didn't, we didn't start with a bad intention, but our good intention sometimes can be turned into disastrous consequences. And that and many other such movements started the environmental movement of how we need to address the consequences of our actions. So I'm Moving forward, fast forward, the United Nations, the organization that Daryl and I work for, wanted to do something about it. So the United Nations convened the first conference on the environment in 1972 called the Stockholm Conference on Environment, where Stockholm in, in, in Sweden, world leaders, gathered there and then started taking stock of the change that we have brought to this world. There weren't that many world leaders that took, play, uh, took part. There were the senior leaders of the government came to that conference. Obviously, the Swedish Prime Minister was there. And the Prime Minister of India was also there, Indira Gandhi. And she said, yes, the environment is important, but uh, people like us, countries that emerged from centuries of colonialism, that we are just starting to develop. 
Now our problem is not environment, our problem is poverty. How to reduce poverty? So that tied in with environment with the development. That we need to think about environment, environmental stability, environmental protection, but at the same time we need to think about poverty. So these are two sides of the same coin. So how to improve the quality of life of billions of people who have emerged from the ravages of colonialism. And then they are slowly developing. They are using these new technologies. So how we can understand how we can develop on the one hand without causing the environmental problems. So the United Nations uh, further had another conference 10 years later and then we had conferences every 10 years subsequently, looking at various aspects of environmental development. And in 1992, we had a, a major international conference. Can someone tell me what that conference was? The Earth Summit. The Earth Summit, indeed. Thank you. Yes, the Earth Summit. It happened in 1992 in Rio de Janeiro in Brazil. It's called the Earth Summit. The United Nations was in the forefront, it organized the event, and that was one of the first international conference on environmental development with the largest number of world leaders participated, including the heads of state of the United States and various other countries. And they drew up a declaration that we need to tackle climate change, that's happening, global warming, the destruction of biological diversity, and also we are having desertification. That means many of our countries are losing the land to deserts. That can be because of uh, human-induced activities and various other environmental factors as well. So, at the 1992 Earth Summit, they came up with a declaration. They wanted to do something. They came up with a an action plan called Agenda 21. What the world should do, what kind of actions we need to take to change the situation, to create a sustainable world where people who have the aspirations, who are still in extreme poverty, how they can improve the quality of life and how rich countries that have developed, that have been using fossil fuels and, uh, and um, materials that dug up from the earth, minerals and so on and so forth, to improve their quality of life further. So how we can make a balanced approach to development. That's where sustainable development as a concept came about. But I will come back to peace at the end of my talk. The best definition for sustainable development can be found in a report that is compiled by the United Nations under the leadership of a remarkable person, remarkable lady, called Brundtland, who was at that time the Prime Minister of Norway. Norway is a country, a small country, we spent a few years in Norway, a country that has some of the best quality of life in the world. In any chart you take, whether it's about quality of life, or peace and, peace and security, and so on and so forth, we know about one ter terrible incident that happened a couple of years ago by a madman murdering you know, hundreds of young people. But Norway is a wonderful country that punches above its weight in terms of your, its contribution to preserving the world through various activities, giving lots of money to preserve our forests, foreign aid, and so on and so forth. It's a country that we should all emulate. And many other countries also do great things to help the world. So the Brundtland Commission report defines sustainable development as development that meets that meets the needs of the present without compromising the needs of the future generations. It's very important. We should be thinking about improving our own quality of life, yes indeed, of all citizens of this planet, rich countries, poor countries that are trying to develop, and also we need to leave this earth for future generations, because they also have a right. And there's no one here yet to speak for them. 
So that's what sustain the key to sustainable development is. So we need to think in terms of uh, development that meets the needs of the present, extreme poor, and also how the rich should adjust the life systems so that they can share some of the knowledge and resources with the poor. And also sometimes they need to change their own lifestyle to some extent, the value systems that they need. So the key word here is meet the needs as opposed to the want. See, the problem is that we want more things. We want three cars, we want bigger houses, we want to have this and that. But if we go with that idea, then the world will never be sustainable. But if we say we want to meet our needs, we have plenty in this world. We produce enough food in this world. It is a crime in the 21st century that hundreds of millions of people go hungry in this world, even though we produce enough food. And it, you know, various organizations have come up with a study saying that one third of the food we produce today is wasted. It's wasted. I mean, that is a crime. At the same time, there are people who are hungry. And even in rich countries, very rich countries, there are people who go hungry. It is not a problem for just extremely poor countries for various reasons, because of conflicts, because of their own mismanagement, bad governance, corruption, all those sort of things. We have enough to feed this world. We have enough to go around. But we can't do that. That is the key to sustainable development. And there is this uh, misunderstanding that sustainable development is economic growth. It is not. It is not. World leaders, whenever they have an economic problem, they say we need more growth. We need more growth, they say, to create more jobs. This will not lead to a peaceful world where we can live. Growth is important, yes, I'm not saying that it is not important at all, but this one-way track of grow, grow, grow is not going to get us anywhere to sustainable development. This is what, where I want young people to think about an alternative. How can we have produced enough? We can have a fantastic quality of life in this world with the technology we have, with the know-how we have, but we are not there. So we need an action plan for that. So sustainable development is not sustaining economic growth. This is a key thing that we need to understand. Businesses talk about we need to grow, but we need to think, you know, we are extremely clever people, human beings, but we do extremely stupid things too. I mean, we have come up with fantastic things. We went to the moon. I mean, that is a remarkable thing, how even without advanced computer technology, we went there. And we have achieved some remarkable things as human beings. We map our brains, you know, we have done all those sort of things. But we haven't come up with a, a very good way of doing about how to do economic things in a way that would be sustainable. So economic growth recently has taken place. Fantastic growth. The world has become enormously rich the past 20 years or so. You wouldn't even believe countries that were considered once very poor, like India, for example, or Brazil, South Africa. Others have grown very rich. There are billionaires. You know, there are more billionaires now in China, India, that put combined than anywhere else in the world. These countries have grown enormously rich, but and, and graduated to something the economists call middle-income countries. And these middle-income countries have more poor people. And the extreme, you know, the inequality in these countries have grown up. And this is, this is, you know, unbelievable. Why is this happening? For example, I can give you this uh, statistics from Oxfam. Many of you might have come up, uh, read this. 85 richest individuals are as wealthy as the poorest half of the world. The world has 7 billion plus people. That means these individuals, combined wealth is equal to the wealth of 3.5 billion people. 
And then you these people have only about a dollar or two. But you know, there, there are also people somewhat in the lower middle class range. That is the way the world is. Not that I'm against making wealth. Well, reproduction is that creation is a fantastic thing. Bill Gates and others, you know, the richest man, he gives away all his money. He promises to give away all his money. But this structural problem that we have in the global economy is not something that we are addressing. You know, it is not like give away a little bit when you know I became an enormously rich, so I want to give something away. We need to think in terms of how we can create wealth and distribute that to the people who need. Not give free, but, but give them the opportunities. How to create these structural conditions. The Arundhati Roy, how many of you have heard about Arundhati Roy, a famous writer from India who uh, wrote The God of Small Things? She has a piece uh, in the, uh, about two, three months ago she wrote called Capitalism, a Ghost Story. It's about a, a remarkable thing happened in Mumbai, that used to be called Bombay. There's one, one in India's richest individual, that sounds a rag to richest story, that his father was um, a small petty tra tra trader, and he became uh, one of the very successful industrialists in India. And his two sons, two Ambani's, combined wealth of several billion dollars. And this one individual built a house overlooking India's slum in near Mumbai for $1.5 billion spent there. And he doesn't live there because it doesn't have the proper feng shui. He uses that. It's a 27-story um, building called Antilla. And this is the kind of extreme conditions that we have in this, in this world. And, 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 and the reason he uses it only for meetings, entertaining guests, and business meetings, and so on and so forth. It has five levels of um, parking. It has got two helipads at the top, and got 100 of 1,500 people working every day in that. You know? and, I mean, the, 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 this, I'm not saying that you should not have a right to build a fantastic home, but there's a moral question here. Why would someone want a house built for $1.5 billion? So we, we need to think about ourselves. Some introspection is necessary. This man is enormously successful. I'm not saying that he doesn't have the right to build anything. But this is a kind of waste of resources that we going on in this world. The youth need to take this, you know, a proactive action in that. You should read Arundhati Roy's piece about it, about, the, about this particular incident. And there are so many other things that she talks about. Just Google her name, and you will see so many of her speeches that she gives all over the world, particularly the United States, on, on, on the excesses of modern economic system. So, sustainable development. We can develop, we can grow sustainably, we can also live in, in a peaceful world with enough for everyone to go around, but we need various conditions for that. I, I, I won't be able to go into all those details. So the original concept of sustainable development has three important components. One is society, the other one is economy, the third one is environment. We need economic development. Obviously, we need economic development because we have so many poor people in the world. We need to grow. We need to produce more food in some areas. We need to produce you know, clothes. We need, we need to have people with access to water. We have a, a very severe condition for billions of people who still do not have access to a toilet, a primary necessity for billions of people. We don't have that. So we need to have grow. We also need to improve our social conditions. Social development is very important. Access to education, access to economic opportunities, and, uh, and, and also, reduce the inequalities between different communities. So we need social development, and we need to preserve our environment, environmental conservation and protection. So all these three components are necessary to create sustainable development. So I, I was talking about my background, my most recent background as working for the United Nations. So in 2000, 
at the Millennium Summit, the United Nations convened another important meeting like 1992 called the Millennium Summit, where again, largest number of world leaders gathered in New York, where that is the headquarters of the United Nations, where they pledged that we need to do something about eradicating extreme poverty in the world, improving the health conditions of women, putting more children into schools, and, and various other such goals. So it drew up eight goals, called the Millennium Development Goals. How many of you know about the Millennium Development Goals? And you can recite of probably all eight of those goals, right? Millennium Development Goals. And what we wanted was to have these goals met by 2015. 2015 is next year. And where are we now? Did we meet all these goals? Did anyone follow up? We did quite well in some areas. Eradicating extreme poverty, we were able to pull millions of people out of poverty, especially in China, India, Brazil, South Africa, many other countries. We were able to pull people out of extreme poverty. But we are still have millions of extremely poor people out there. But by 2030, the World Bank pledges that we will remove extreme poverty. That means that people living less than a dollar, 25 or two, will be reduced to perhaps maybe 1% or 2%. So we hope that we can achieve that, Millennium Development Goals. Now, these are the MDGs you can see there. Extreme, goal one, eradicate extreme hunger and poverty from the base of 1990. Halve it by 2015. That is the idea now. We cannot completely eradicate poverty, but at least reduce it by half. Achieve universal primary education. Many countries have achieved this, universal primary education, but still many countries are lagging behind. Then we have the question of, uh, we have access to education for many children, but the quality of the education is not very good because of poor te teachers, infrastructures, facilities are not very good. So we can talk about those things later on. Promote gender equality and empower women. Did pro we did make some progress in many parts of the world, but still this is not a goal that has been achieved yet for, for girls and women. Reduce child mortality, yes, we have done remarkable things about this in many parts of the world, but still we have tremendous problems, particularly in conflict uh, areas. Improve maternal health. Uh, number six, combat HIV, AIDS, malaria, and other diseases. We are making some progress, but then again, now we are coming up with a new pandemic, like Ebola. Ensure environmental sustainability is another goal. And finally, develop a global partnership for development. Now, 2015 is coming up next year. So we had a, a conference the 4th of uh, 2012 in Rio called the Rio Plus 20. The Plus 20 after the 1992. I was there. I led the delegation for the United Nations University. Uh, we had various side events. The world leaders met there and discussed what we should do to carry forward the successes of Millennium Development Goals and come up with new goals, new ideas. So we are now talking about sustainable development goals. That's the agenda for post-2015. So right now, discussions are taking place in New York and various parts of the world to come up with these indicators. The latest I have checked is that there are some 17 goals, but that is, that's too many. We are so going to reduce it to a manageable number, what you call sustainable development goals. So as Young people, I, I want you to get involved in that. There want to be some of those goals that we should have, we should develop. So we can send this proposal to the United Nations. They take it very seriously. So that, that's something that I'm going to talk about, an action plan to include how young people could take part in this process. This is a consultative process. We should not leave it to the world leaders, government uh, heads and others who meet there and then they go away, and then they forget it. So that could be an action plan that we can, that we can develop. So 
I will conclude, and I want to open up this session for um, for the questions. So, coming back to the theme of this conference, peace, sustainable development, and peace. I'm not an expert in peace building or peace studies. I'm like a, a learner. So my suggestion is very simple. How can peace and sustainable development can be integrated? And then come up with an action plan for that. So peace, justice, equity, essential for sustainable development. We need to have peace. We need to have justice. There's tremendous violation of justice in this world. Without justice, we cannot have peace. A lot of people, for a lot of people, their rights to, to a decent living conditions, right to nationality, right to maintain the culture, right to uh, live uh, peacefully. You know, these are, these are not still achieved for a lot of people in the world. So we need to think about justice. And equity is a very important concept. We cannot legislate equity. But we need to think of creating the conditions for equitable access to education, employment, and where people want to live, and where people can move, and, and, and things of that sort. And this is essential for sustainable development. So without a de development that's sustainable, peace is not possible. Without peace and justice, sustainable development is just a myopia. So we need an action plan for building peace for creating sustainable future, sustainable societies. So for that, we education we need education for peace and sustainable development. We have done some work with the United Nations University, but I'm not going to go into the details of that, creating certain centers of expertise on sustainable development. But I can get into some of the details if you're interested in. But we need to create such an action plan. So I hope that uh, we can uh, come up with such an action plan. I don't have an idea. But maybe the next uh, year uh, on camp, you might be able to uh, do something. So I, I urge you to think about this, how we can come up with an action plan for combining, integrating peace with sustainable development. It may not be like a grand thing. It can be a, working with the community. It can be with an existing NGO. It can be about the wasting food, for example. We had a, a, one of our... It's a regional centers of expertise in Korea when I was working for the institute in the town of Tongyang. The mayor was the most active person in this. And they had schools, they had the museums, they had communities, and then colleges took part in this. And then they came up with one action plan, which is not waste any food to teach children that either. There's so much food is wasted. So that's a very simple thing, you know, how not to waste. That's an action plan. That can create sustainable development conditions. And there were many other examples that, that I could cite. So with that, I will conclude. And thank you very much for your attention. Questions, please. Yes. Uh, 